So today I'm going to do a couple of things. Um, I'm going to first read a little bit from John 14. It's John 14, 5. I'm just going to read that. Then I'm going to go to John 17. Jesus, Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you know me, you know my Father too. From this moment you know him and have seen him. This is again uh, the purpose of this talk is to look at the, you know, the intimacy of Jesus to the Father, of Jesus looking upwards instead of across to his disciples. And that how we need to look upwards to connect back with the Father. So Philip said, Lord, let us see the Father and then we shall be satisfied. Have I been with you all this time, Philip? Said Jesus to him, and you still do not know me? To have seen me is to have seen the Father. So how can you say, let us see the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak as of myself. It is the Father living in me who is doing this work. You must believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Believe it on the evidence of this work, if not for no other reason. I tell you solemnly, whoever believes in me, will perform the same works as I do myself. He will perform even greater works. Because I am going to the Father. Whoever, Whatever you ask for in my name, I will do. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask for anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I shall ask the Father... And he will send you another advocate, counsellor, protector, to be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. So again, this is um, Jesus. Um, he's trying to point the disciples to the Father. He's trying to make the connection between himself and the Father. He's saying things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, the word in the Greek is icon, or we get the word icon. Of course, that's used loosely today. And, um, you know, but really that word is used in its prime and purest sense of Jesus is the icon of God. Okay. So sometimes it, in our culture, it again becomes popularized. And becomes the word sort of becomes quite meaningless, but it really means something very special in the scripture. Jesus is the icon of the Father. I want to go to John 17 now and just read a few verses from there. And um, again, it's about the Father. After saying this, Jesus raised his eyes to heaven. Now, Jesus just finished. Talking, about, talking to his disciples about the Holy Spirit and to his disciple, uh, and, and, and just talking to the, Holy, uh, to the, to the disciples. Um, he's trying to communicate the meaning of his approaching the departure. So he's talking to his um, disciples. He's trying to tell them that he's going, something's happening. And he's trying to now take the focus off that back to God and to back to where he's going, to the Father. Now, why would I be speaking about this today? Well, because I think we need to go back to that focus too as individuals because there are a lot of things that are worrying people today or concerning people. Um, and we talked about revelation. We need to have revelation and we can't really get revelation unless we're in communication with the Father through the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, when things come along, they'll vex us. They'll disturb us. 
we won't be able to really understand them because what we will be trying to do is understand something with a natural mind only. Now, we do need to use our mind and we do need to be logical. But it's important that we uh, remember that the only way we're really going to comprehend spiritual truth is through the work of the Holy Spirit. And the only way we're going to really understand things when we read something um, because even today, you, you don't know. It, it, look, it's, it's a difficult time in one sense now to lead a group of Christians because there's so many things out there. There's so many voices, even within the Christian church. And it really, really, it's, it's very hard to maintain what is true, to get revelation of what is true, to go deeper in what is true and at the same time be relevant to people, which is what people are doing when they're going out into the street. Here, when we're going to the market, we're trying to be relevant and connect people where they're at, but we've got to connect them with the truth. We can't compromise on the truth. It's a really not an easy time. And then we can be judgmental of others because they don't match up to certain theological standards and... You know, it really is difficult, and you know that's valid too. But sometimes a person's on a journey, and we've got to look at what the Holy Spirit's doing in them and bringing them along the journey before we jump on them. So it is a complex. It's not as easy, you know. In times gone by, people who had confidence in their leaders and they listened to what you know their pastor or their bishop said. People don't do that much now. It's really not, you know, and. Because there's so many things and so many voices, and even sometimes people like that are influenced wrongly. And so you, everyone's got to be on their toes. It's not an easy time. But we can be confident in this, that if we have the Holy Spirit and we're communicating with the Father through the Holy Spirit and our focus on Jesus Christ, and that we do our best uh, to connect with the people, the right people, then, then, that, then we will be safe because we're in the Father's bosom. We're in, you know, in His care. And we know that we're protected. And we know that even if we do make a mistake, we can easily come back if we get something not quite right. So it's very important for us to, to develop this and as I said, Jesus turns his attention from earth to heaven, from his disciples to his Father. Our focus has always has to be ultimately to the Father, through Jesus Christ, of course. And, uh, you know... Um, Petitions, when we pray, we often pray, I often pray, we pray, I pray, prayers for me. God, give me this and give me that and give me that. But you know, most of the prayers that are in Scripture, you might be able to tell me what they are in light of what I just said. Most of them are about asking God for knowledge, personal knowledge. If you look at the prayers in Ephesians. And if we think we know it all, we don't because we need further revelation of what truth is. We might know truth or we might belong to a particular creed and we've got all the things right and that's good, that's, not, that's healthy. But before that can become something that I'm passionate about, I believe in, and I really, really know is right in my heart, not only in my head, I need personal knowledge. And who can supply that? The Father can supply that through Jesus in the power of the Spirit. So that's very, very important. Because we live in an age where we're obsessed with ourselves. And our feelings. Most people make decisions from their feelings. Now feelings are good. We need to recognise them. 
it's healthy to recognise your feelings, but and to know what your feelings are saying. But we're not run by our feelings because our feelings can sometimes tell us to do the wrong thing. So in this time when we're, our whole society is obsessed about being happy, obsessed, obsessed with ourselves, it's important that we remember that Scripture wants us to be obsessed if being obsessed with anything is with God and knowledge about him. That's really where it counts. And that's very, very important. Personal knowledge of God is a key to opening up our life. It's where the Christian faith has supremacy. Because in a lot of religions... There isn't this personal relationship with God. But we, we're privileged to have knowledge of that. And most of us here, if not all, have had some measure of that. Now what we've got to do is, is to get things right by really seeking that above everything else. Now we can seek... Uh, more, more uh, knowledge. We can seek more experience. We can seek the latest modern Christian thing. We can do all those things and they're all good. But if we don't seek and get to know him more, then it will not really advance our spiritual life. And, you know, one of the best examples on this life is marriage. As you get to know someone as you spend more time with them, or any friend. You know, if you have a friend um, that you want to f form and a, a, have a relationship with, you have to spend time with that person to get to know them. You know? And so it's very important that we really spend time. With God, again, the biggest problem in the church today is that, I don't know what the latest statistics are, but at one time, your average minister, anyway, um, priests might pray a bit more because they have an office they're supposed to look at, pray every day, but certainly your average out there was a couple of minutes a day. Now, how are you going to... That's the average. I'm not saying everyone... It, it, when I, some years ago when I was looking at some statistics there's only a few minutes a day well that's just impossible you can't run anything of God with that see, see how much our society has invaded our lives the phone and the television and the computer and all the other things and, you know and we um, again get so busy I mean, a lot of us are so busy um, and I was really glad to see so many young adults um, make that weekend because it looked at one stage, everyone's so busy, we couldn't get enough uh, to secure our booking. But at the end, it worked out all right. Whatever that is, whether it's the marriage um, um, night that we're doing, again, most of us might be our children, but... We're just too busy, aren't we? We're too busy working. We're too busy paying off the bills. We're too busy earning a living. We're too busy in this society. But then we do make cathedrals of other things. As we drive down, drive down here on Sunday mornings, we, we, we drive over the bridge at Penrith and on the left-hand side is the coffee club. <laughs> And even that, as early as we leave at about 8, 8.15, as early as about that time, the place is packed. The cars are bountiful. <laughs> and that's the, the new cathedrals and the shopping centres of the modern age. And that's why, you know, we do have to go out there, as we're doing. But it's not what God wants. He wants people to be in a place like this 
where they are actually meeting together and worshipping God. Um, so you can be in a sense an insider there, there's a lot of talks now in the political area about insiders and outsiders okay because as you I'm, I don't want to speak a lot about politics because I'm not trying to push this but we have we have new classes of people are are now f- forming in society, and there are there are leaders, and um, that's human nature. It's always happened. They're, they're forming in a different way now. They're called insiders, and most of us on the on the fringes or Christians are now becoming outsiders. <laughs> so, you know, you can be a, an insider in a Christian sense, by belonging to a group such as this or belonging to a good church or whatever, but actually still inside be an outsider. Uh, Because you don't really know God deeply. You know, you can know the Bible without ever knowing God. In fact, I, you know, in the at some point in our life, uh, a person lived with us. It was like this. He knew the Bible better than I did. You were backwards, but he didn't know God. He had no relationship with God. That's really sad. That's that's possible. So knowing the Father is very very important. So. Um, John writes in John 17 that Jesus comes to this point. He's leaving this earth. He's leaving his friends. He's leaving his disciples. He's leaving everything that he's known on earth. Don't forget Jesus was fully human as well as fully divine. There was one person of Jesus with two natures. That's the Christian teaching. And one of the biggest problems today, as I said earlier, is that there are a lot of groups of people and some people who may even call themselves Christian who deny the the divinity of Christ, which is an absolute no-no for a Christian. Can't do that. You know, that's not negotiable one, that one. And Jesus is now as I said, looking to the Father. Um, And he says this, Father, the hour has come, or the time has come. Glorify your Son, so that your Son may glorify you. I'm deeply touched by Jesus and by his prayers. Because you see, when, when you read those prayers of Jesus. You see the intimacy that he has with his Father and the relationship of the Trinity here. That it's a family. And um, church should be an army, but it also should be a family. It's both. Scripturally, it's both. And Jesus models both. It's important to, to keep a good tension between those two. Some people want it all family, some people want it all an army. But Jesus, to me, it always touches me because this comes back to the love of God. I think I was talking to um, John, Johnny Black and he said the thing that, another thing that he didn't share I, uh, this morning was when he won the weekend, he, he really got hold of this concept that it's the love of God that ultimately matters. Is that right? I'm not misquoting you. That's good. I think you shared that this week. Because it does. And when you see it modelled like this, hey, there's no better way. When you see it and you experience it and you read it in the Scriptures and you yourself are developing this relationship with the Father, 
it really breaks you down. You know, Jesus is the icon of God. And again, you know, some people think, well, if I see a good marriage, I can model my marriage on that. Or if I see a good priest or a good pastor or a good, I can model myself on, on that person. But here we have the ultimate model, the ultimate person to model. And the ultimate way of relating as a Christian. Because ultimately it's about this relationship. So, you know, we can be a Christian. We can have some degree, but it's a growing relationship. We have to grow and grow into it. Hopefully, and this is um, sometimes a problem with, you know, Christians as we go so far and we think, oh, we've got certain things in place and, you know, my marriage is going okay and kids are going okay. But really, you've missed the point if that's the case because it's all about your relationship with the Father. Those things are a byproduct. And if you get stuck there, you won't grow and you won't continue to be blessed in this relationship. Again, the marriage relationship is you know, the best analogy I can give you on earth when it's going well. You get to love someone, you get deeper with someone as time goes on. It, it, it gets better if it's in God and it's going. But here we have the ultimate relationship, if you like. The relationship. There is nothing that can compare with this relationship. And just notice the tenderness. Notice the affection. Notice the... the um, the way Jesus gives glory to the Father and how he, he's pleasing him and you know, really acknowledging him in his, in his life as he comes to finish his earthly life. And then he goes on to say, and, th- and through the power over all mankind, and the word there is all flesh. That's what it means that you have given him. So the Father has given Jesus power over all flesh, that means over every human being that's ever existed. That's, of course, for those that believe in him. Because if you don't, if, if, if you don't want the, you don't want Jesus to have that power over you, you won't have it. It'll leave you to yourself. It's extraordinary. Such was is, was and is the love of God and the love of this great relationship which we enter into as Christians. Again, the difference between Christians and any other group is this relationship. In other groups and religions there isn't this intimacy. God is far more distant. But in Christianity, we're actually invited through the Holy Spirit into this intimate relationship. Sometimes um, when someone invites you into their family, particularly if you're a single person, that gives you great strength. When somebody invites you and brings you into their family and reaches out to you. You Yeah, this is again an analogy of God, how he reaches out for us to join that family, to be part of that family. Because if, you know, um, again we can do a lot of Christian things, but if we don't have that, then we're not growing in that. That's what I'm trying to get you to do. Because most of you, if not all, have that relationship. You haven't arrived. It's not all finished in that in this sense. It's got to grow. It's got to grow. And it's got to continue to grow. And Jesus goes on to say, 
And this is the famous, famous verse of scripture. Uh, first of all, I'll finish verse 2. And through the power over all mankind that you've given him, let him give eternal life to all those you've entrusted to him. So that's the free gift of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. It's if, if we repent of our sin and turn to him, then we have it. And then he goes on to say, and this is eternal life, to know you. And this is the whole crux of my talk. To know you, the only true God, because there were other gods, there's only one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So this word, um, to know, is a knowledge as a growing experience. It's not a head knowledge. It's not even an experience once in time. It's a growing, it is that, but it's also a growing experience. So there you are, I've given you scriptural proof from what I'm trying to tell you. It's a growing experience. You, you, you enter more into it, like you enter into a marriage relationship. It gets deeper, it gets more knowledge, gets better. So, Jesus said that this is eternal life. This is, this is the gift of eternal life given to you. But we must grasp the central part of this life. Yes, Jesus came to die for our sins. Central to our faith. Yes, it's all central and highly, highly important. But he, through that, he came to invite us into this relationship that we can grow in day by day. Now again, I don't want to just give another talk. I really want you to see if this is important, that you make time for God. You make time for him as you would in a marriage. Again, no marriage is going to succeed if everyone's, the two people are working 24 hours a day. I mean, I know in some cultures and country, things are so, oh, they're so intense that, uh, um, that, and people have to work long hours that the husband comes in and uh, into the house, he goes to bed, the wife's off to work and they could go days without even seeing each other. Okay? Now, if you, you, you can't just say, oh, I want to grow in relationship with the father, you have to make time for him. You have to give him time. If you find that tough, then... Maybe you do some things like deciding to make a structure to go to communion often. Something that you're going to study the Bible. That you're going to give God certain time so that you get to know even just to sit there and ask the Holy Spirit to, through Jesus to listen to the Father. And we're trying to do that for their prophecy, but it's, it's not only listening for others, but to listen for me. That's very important. Because I can listen for everyone else and not hear God and what God is saying to me. And that's very important too. You know... Even Nicodemus in the Bible, he wanted a theological discussion. But Jesus challenges him to a personal relationship. There are a lot of examples again in life. From marriage again, it's not a business, it's first a relationship. We forget that, marriages break down. See, because when you get real personal with someone whether it's a human being or God you start to lose control of you because we like to control everything 
When you enter into any relationship, there's a certain amount of control that you have to let go of. And when you get to know the Father more and more, there's a certain amount of control that goes from our life because the control is transferred to him. But it's only in the relationship that that can happen. It can't happen in a vacuum. It can't happen just by rules. It can't happen even by studying, you know, long piece of scripture, as good as that is. But it happens by entering into that relationship. And scripture makes a lot of sense when you're in that relationship. That's when revelation comes out of scripture. It's only when I had a deep encounter with the Holy Spirit that scripture really come alive to me. Before that, I was just, you know, didn't, it was good, but I can remember being in church and hearing some Old Testament passages read out and I thought, oh, you know, <laughs> I wasn't quite sure about it and, because you can't understand if you don't if you don't have the Holy Spirit. I remember clear where I was and the scripture was being read out, you know. But now that scripture, I mean, I it means a lot to me because I can understand it through the eyes of God and the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Christianity is a religion of revelation. Okay, as well as knowledge. And when we go back to that verse about Philip, um, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, it, the word there is not does not mean I visually see, you know, like with the retina of our eyes. But it's, the word is, has to do with um, um, discernment. You know, like, you know, even in, in English we have the phrase, oh, I see it. I get it, in other words. I get it. Not I see it meaning that I've seen it with my retina and I can see that. And the Greek word here, that's what it means. Now we can't get it without revelation. We can't get it without the Father. We can't get it without Jesus. And we can't get it without the Holy Spirit. And we can't get it unless we make time to build that relationship. That's critical if we want to grow in him. Jesus goes on to say, I have glorified you on earth and finished the work that you gave me to do. Now, you see, some people, this used to be a little bit me, are preoccupied with doing the will of God, which is a great thing. But doing the will of God and doing things for God has to come out of this relationship, not out of, I've got to do this. And Jesus here, through these words, gives us an indication of the attitude in which he's done the things that his father's asked him to do. He says, I've glorified you on it and finished the work you gave me to do. In relationship. In relationship. Jesus didn't go around struggling to do God's will or in any sort of bondage to do the will of God. And this is the problem with non-Christians. They, well, they used to see Christianity as a lot of, you know, you can't do this and you can do that, things like that. Uh, but uh, if you don't know him, of course it is. Uh, you know, it's, that's the way it is. But if you know him, if you can be like Jesus, if you can enter into this relationship, you can say with the utmost confidence and the utmost joy and the utmost pleasure, I've done your will. I've done what you've asked me to do. Out of love and out of response to the Father. 
So get to know the Father. And I know that there's, there's usually some of us need healing because images of Father or relationships with fathers have not been good. They've been poor or deficient, like all of us, including myself. And therefore, it's not easy. So we may need some prayer to help us in, in towards this relationship with the Father. Because, um, you know, um, it, it, the devil, it's been one of the devil's plans, and I'm not going to go into that now, but it's one of the devil's plans to knock off society. Now, Father, it is the time for you to glorify me with, the, with that glory I had with you before ever the world was. And so again, here we, we, you know, we go back to the essence of God, that Jesus was not a created being. He was always with God. And he was equal, he's co-equal with the Father. This again is the basic Trinitarian theology. All God, all equal, but have obviously different functions. So Jesus is stating here, again, something that is not negotiable with the Christian faith. And, you know, again, I'm trying to say this because there are some things we can disagree on, on the fringes, but there are, there are certain non-negotiables to remain a Christian that you've got to have. And a lot of them centre on Jesus himself because that's how the early church had problems with the Trinity and Jesus. And the early church had to work out a lot of things and they had a lot of problems. And a lot of them reappeared and keep reappearing throughout the centuries. I have made your name known to the men you took from the world to give me. Again, tremendous intimacy here. I've made your name known to the men you took from the world and, you, and to give to me. Extraordinary. You know, people read love poems and I, I did a university course once in, 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 in arts and I had to do English literature and poetry and... But, there's nothing that beats this for intimacy. Nothing. This scripture. It's extraordinary. You know. That's what we should want. More than anything else in life. And again, what are we doing? If we do want it, we have to take certain action. That includes young people. Do you have a time for God each day? Or you allocate it to God? Time to develop this relationship. If you give marriage seminars, you know, you, you, you talk about that there has to be certain times where you spend together if it doesn't happen naturally. So how are we going with this? Are we growing in our relationship with the Father? Are we growing in our relationship with God? Or are we fairly static? As you know, if you're static, you probably start to slip backwards a bit. Again, we'll read on. You can just, if you want to start, just read this chapter over and over again. I've made na your name known to the men you took from the world to give me. They were yours and you gave them to me. And they kept your word. Wonderful. Now, at last, they know that all that you've given me comes indeed from you. For I have given them the teaching you gave to me. And they have truly accepted this, that I came from you and have believed that it is you who sent me. Again, this is faith. Again, it's just extraordinary to the natural mind. And the beauty of this, you can actually have the tenderness of with the Holy Spirit, to enter into this prayer. Remember what Jesus, Jesus' prayers, were, were, were most prayer in the scripture is not about give me, give me, but it's about 
Lord, give me more knowledge of you. So is that our prayer? How often do we make that prayer? I challenge you. How often do I make that prayer? Lord, I want to know you more. I want to get to know you more. I want to enter in your heart more.